and welcome. Welcome to what is a special hour of the briefing here on Sirius XM POTUS 124. We're about a month into the 118th Congress, and already the political battle lines have been drawn. We are seeing much of this play out in the House of Representatives, which is why we are pleased today to welcome two members from two different parties, a Democrat and Republican, to talk about the state of the country. And yet they've also proven that despite the often harsh political rhetoric here in Washington, and it is harsh at times, things can and hopefully will get done. Don Bacon is a Republican. He represents Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District. Salud Carverhall is a Democrat from California's 24th Congressional District. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us here Good in the Sirius XM studios. We appreciate it. Good to be here. Thanks thank for stopping you. by. Congressman Bacon, let's begin with the debt limit because negotiations continue between the president and congressional leaders, the Speaker of the House. But at the end of the day, there has to be an agreement. What will it look like? I totally agree. We have to have an agreement at some point. I think initially you're going to have the president and the speaker negotiate. Hopefully they can make some good progress and, and get something on their own. But let's say that they can't and they're at a, you know, a, a loss of trying to bridge that gap. I think it will be folks like Slude and I and the Problem Solvers Caucus and some related kind of bipartisan groups that we work together on. We're also on the Four Country Caucus together, uh, half and half of veterans, half Democrat, half Republican. I think the rough concept that will be likely is discretionary spending will uh, be tethered to inflation to some degree. The, the, the negotiation will be, is it 1% below inflation or 2% below inflation? But I, I think there'll be the rough concept for discretionary spending. And I think there'll be a commission or a bipartisan committee set up to look at how we're going to handle mandatory spending. Because in the end, this cannot be a Republican or a Democrat solution on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. It's going to have to be a bipartisan way forward to get that done. So I think the the agreement will be a commission or a committee that's bipartisan and spending on discretionary tied to inflation. Part of the debate, Congressman Carver Hall, is on Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. That's where the bulk of the money is right now. How do you resolve that? And do you trust House Republicans who say that's off the table? Well, we've been hearing mixed messages, whether it's on the table, off the table. Um, so the first thing I think is that I think the president and Ms. McCarthy need to come up with some long term concepts that might help address this issue in the long term and address the debt ceiling as it relates to our overall general budget process. I mean, face it, um, the debt negotiating uh, on the debt ceiling is not really the most productive if you're really trying to address our national debt or to get to a balanced budget. We have to do something completely different. And uh, the great thing about me and, and Don is that we can agree to disagree on a lot of things. And I just think that there's a, 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 an appropriate process to really get into how we're going to continue to spend or not during our budget process. I think uh, to use the, the debt limit is, is it could be chaotic and we could default and that could be calamitous for our economy. So I, I'm hopeful that this discussion could lead to some long-term concepts of a commission of how we might be able to come together uh, and address those long-term issues. But I certainly hope that it doesn't lead to any default. And I hope there's a commitment uh, to not do that. As you know, in the last 20 years, we've had two Democratic and two Republican administrations in the White House. And the nation's debt has gone from about $6 trillion to $31.4 trillion. Would you agree that both parties are to blame? Absolutely. <clears throat> Our previous president didn't really make it a priority to begin with. I mean, he had various other priorities out there. So, I mean, I, I would say it, it's been equally, it's been bad on both sides, and we both should take ownership of it. And I think it's important that we do so now, because if you don't consider Social Security, we're at about 100% debt to GDP level. And if you consider Social Security, we're about 120% uh, debt to GDP level. And most Financial smart people will tell you if you're at 100 percent, that is very bad. So we, we, we both sides got to take this serious. Can you do this, Congressman Carver Hall, by just cutting spending? Can you reduce the nation's debt by just doing that? I think there needs to be a discussion on spending and revenues. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you could do it just focusing on, on, on cuts. I think you need to have it a twofold. And again, I also agree with Don. This has been both parties that have put all the debt that we're dealing with that we're talking about. Both parties have done that. Uh, raising the, the debt limit is only about paying our bills. 
that we need to do so to continue functioning as a country and to continue to make good on all our obligations. Um, so I, I think we need to look at it from that perspective. Keep in mind, during the last administration, the Trump administration, there was no haranguing over the debt ceiling. Uh, so we're, we're just kind of wondering what's changed. So I think COVID was a factor for that. People thought, hey, we got an obligation with a paycheck protection plan and whatnot. I will, if I can maybe piggyback with what Salud said, when it comes to discretionary spending, I wouldn't favor a tax increase for that. However, when it comes to the mandatory spending side and figuring out how to secure Social Security for the next 20, 30, 40 years, Medicare, Medicaid, there will likely be some revenue uh, discussions there, along with some other uh, long-term systemic fixes. But that's going to have to take a Republican and Democrat plan. If Republicans try to do it on our, on our own, we'll get killed. If Democrats try to do it on their own, they're going to get killed by the, you know, in the political process. It's got to be a joint effort to shore up these uh, mandatory programs. So what would that look like, Social Security in particular? How do you deal with that to make sure it's secure for the next 50 years? The last major agreement was bipartisan mm -hmm. when Ronald Reagan was in the White House, Tip O'Neill was Speaker, but that was uh, almost 40 years ago. I heard one proposal in a bipartisan meeting uh, that we could look at adjusting the, the cap. Right now the cap's around 150000 You can modify that cap so it brings in more revenue. Uh, they could also consider, because when Social Security was put together, the life expectancy was 63 and payout was a 65. So now it's significantly different. So we may want, we could consider adjusting the retirement age for those under 40, but set it at 60, so 67, 68. So you could stagger that in. And then some people have even considered some means testing. But my point being is there's different, that we could do a combination of these things and Social Security would be secure for decades to come. Ye I was going to say, and the best way to do that is establish some true bipartisan commissions mm -hmm. that are truly going to look at this issue in a nonpartisan way, not in a political scoring point, uh, brinksmanship, but really how can we uh, implement the types of actions that need to be taken to shore up the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare Trust Fund and all those trust funds that are important and part of um, mandatory spending. You both came to Congress together back in 2017, and we're going to talk later about the American Congressional Exchange Program, which, by the way, is in partnership with the Bipartisan <laughs> Policy Center, which is a co-host of this program at BPC. So I want to talk about that. But are you two the outliers? Because if people look at cable news and they see the shouting and the rhetoric, they would think this town is totally dysfunctional. Already, in a couple of occasions, you have shown respect for each other and agree to disagree. Congressman Bacon? Well, there is a lot of dysfunction in Washington, so we can't dispel that. I think we're a minority, but we're not by ourselves. There's probably about 60 to 80, I don't know what the right uh, actual number is, but there's pretty good collegiality, maybe with a, at least a, maybe a third. I, I think most people are collegial, but not to the point. There's a, there's a smaller subset that do a lot of stuff together across the aisle. And, uh, but we're not by ourselves, but maybe there's like 60 of us, would you say? I would say so. Yeah, about that are do a lot more with each other, actually meet all the time. And so we're on the Problem Solvers Committee, which is roughly, our caucus, about 30 Republican, 30 Democrat. We're, we're reforming right now because after the election, so I'm not sure what the total number will be this time around. We're also on the Four Country Caucus, which is has been 13 Republicans, 13 Democrats uh, that are veterans. And so we meet all the time, and it's really a, you know, it's a, a great place to start from trying to find bipartisan solutions on big issues. So, And then we've, we've done probably about a dozen Codells together. <laughs> so I would say we are my, on the minority side, but there are, there's more of us than just us two. We're so glad to have you here in the Sirius XM studios. I have to ask you because so often we hear that from members of Congress, it's the primary, not the general election, that they worry the most. And that's why bipartisanship on a whole host of issues is so difficult. Is that fair or not? I would say so. Uh, but I would say that it also means pushing the envelope and living up to your own principles. Um, I had a competitive seat, more competitive seat, should I say, early on. Uh, Bacon has a competitive seat. And despite that, we did this exchange, and, and it went really well. I think we w were able to build our relationship as such. I think what sets us apart from others is also that we're both veterans. Mm -hmm. I served in the Marine Corps. Um, Mr. Bacon here served uh, in the Air Force. And we've just ever become really good friends. Uh, Politics aside, uh, despite our differences and how different we vote on so many different things, we also uh, work together on legislation that we both 
put forward that we're able to find common ground on, whether it's for Gold Star Families or the Federal Firefighters Act that both made it over the finish line and signed by the mm -hmm. president. So it's been great working with Don because I think as veterans, we're able to put, when at all possible, uh, our country first over politics and over mm -hmm. our parties. And certainly we get tugged by our parties and we end up uh, voting a certain way uh, oftentimes, but uh, we've been able to really build a relationship that's based on friendship and we're able to uh, transcend uh, the partisan silliness that exists in Washington and really find common ground. And more important than that, we're good friends. Congressman Bacon, did you see the video released by the Memphis Police Department last week? I only read about it. I did not actually see the video, but I read about it to know it was very bad. This week, of course, Tyree Nichols uh, laid to rest. His family will be in Washington next week for the State of the Union address. And Jim Jordan, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, who was on Meet the Press earlier in the week, indicating that he wasn't sure that Congress can do anything to legislate police brutality. W what's your view you know, on that? I listened to his comments, and there is a lot of truth. Some of these people, some people are just, they break the law, and there's already laws that say you can't do this. And so the, these five cops, it appears to me, broke the law. And which is, you know, so we already have laws in place for that. That happens, you know. But I do think there, you know, I, 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 think, I think Senator Tim Scott and the Democrat side in the Senate have two bills that are about 80 percent the same. The two, the outliers in the, on, the, on those two bills is uh, the Democrat bill gets rid of qualified immunity. It also has a it has a, a list of like infractions. If you're a cop and you've been accused of something, but then you were found not guilty of it, they still want to have a record of that. That's on the Democrat bill. The Republican side, we want to preserve qualified immunity, and we don't think we think once you've been found innocent of a charge, then that shouldn't be in your record. And uh, but I think we have an 80 percent. Two bills are 80 percent the same. Seems to me, let's take the 80 percent and, and pass that versus fight over the two things. We can come back to that. Did you see the video? Any thoughts about I, how I Congress saw parts can of it? Yes. Well, I think in California, we're ahead of the curve nationally. Uh, we've impl implemented a, a number of reforms that the rest of the country hasn't necessarily uh, been able to do to date. So I think California is somewhat of a model. And certainly, I think there's the George Floyd and Policing Act that has a lot of reforms that I think could be included in any uh, continued legislation on this issue. Certainly, qualified immunity is an issue that uh, is, per fact, is per perhaps the most challenging component of that. And I think that needs to be worked on more uh, because there's some real challenges with that. But at the same time, I think if you look at the rest of the, that legislation, it provides for some pretty good concepts of reform that are worth considering. And the, the Tim Scott bill is the George Floyd bill, minus the qualified immunity and that list uh, to keep. Congressman Carverhill, your state has been hit hard with mass shootings, uh, several just in the last two weeks. Can anything be done? Well, I think that it's important to recognize that gun safety laws aren't the panacea that are going to solve everything, but they're going to make the environment that much more safer for everyone. Is it perfect? No. But every opportunity you have, uh, for instance, my red flag bill, the Extreme Risk Protection Order Act, which got signed into law in the Safer Communities Act, uh, goes a long way to taking um, weapons away from individuals that are deemed unfit uh, temporarily uh, by the court system, providing uh, due process and to be able to take weapons away from people that are a danger to themselves or others. And I think you can uh, move forward pieces of legislation that continue to make our community safer without giving people the impression that it's going to solve all, all our gun violence, but certainly it's going to make the environment safer. We have some good gun laws on the books now that we need to enforce. I, I find, we, we see this in the Midwest, but all over the country, where, oh, just right about in Chicago, where individuals are arrested for gun violations, and then the prosecutor decides not to prosecute, and they walk right back out. My case, I think we should make it more of a case of enforcing the laws that we have. And I would say we don't want dangerous people that we, that we know are dangerous to have a weapon. So I uh, agree in principle with Salude there. I think the number one problem, though, a lot of prosecutors are not prosecuting these crimes, and they should. 
Don Bacon, a Republican from Nebraska's second congressional district, which includes Omaha and Salud Carvajal from the Central Valley of California, Democrat from the 24th congressional district. When we come back, I have to ask you about the 15 round roll call vote for the House Speaker and a fun fact about your congressional district. We're pleased to welcome students from the Washington Center coming to you from the Series XM studios here in Washington. Much more after this. What a great audience, and welcome back to the Hugh Panera Performance Studios at Sirius XM here in our nation's capital. Pleased to have the students from the Washington Center representing colleges and universities from around the country. We'll get some of their questions later in the program. And our two members of Congress, Republican Don Bacon from Omaha and a Democrat, Salud Carvajal from California's Central Coast. 15 rounds before Kevin McCarthy became Speaker what was it like? How many days? Five days? Four days? Five days. Uh, we went from Monday through Friday, and actually it was Saturday morning, I believe, is when the last vote was taken, morning. early in the morning. I was uh, angry and frustrated because I've served on teams. And when 90% of the folks are voting for a certain individual, you coalesce around the winner and you come together as a team. So I, what I saw was a lack of teamwork, a lack of, you know, thinking of the broader picture. It was, uh, And I saw... In some cases, too much of, I would call more selfish behavior, uh, I mean, to the point where people are asking for committee chairmanships for their vote. And so, yeah, I was, I was angry and put off by uh, the behavior of some. And then subsequently, they said, well, we got 15 concessions. This is not true. Uh, they got one main concession was to vacate the chair vote for the speaker down to one person. And they got some commitments to bring some votes to the floor. But we went through all that for really one change to the rules. And I... I didn't think it was, I think it, it hurt the party. I think it hurt the Congress. It hurt uh, what we were trying to do. Matt Gates was among them leading this effort. Were you angry at him? Yes. I just gotta leave with that. <laughs> do elaborate. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there was demand for having the personnel subcommittee, uh, military personnel subcommittee as part of the armed services committee. Uh, he was requested to be the chair. And uh, so I, I didn't think, I mean, when you, when you come up forward and say, I'll vote for you if you give me a chairmanship. I, to me, that that is the swamp. That's the kind of stuff that you know we we're trying to not be like. So I obviously disagreed with it. Uh, I was part of the team advocating for the for Kevin McCarthy, uh, particularly once the first vote occurred. I thought it, you know as a team we should pull together. So I was probably one of the more vocal folks um, going after the twenty and really the six that was the main leaders of it. And on your side of the aisle, the vote count remained the same, 212, 212, yes. 212. Never changed. Teamwork well, over there. Well, at first it was comical, but then it became uh, serious. You know, we needed to start governing. We needed mm -hmm. to start setting up our committees. We want to start getting legislation off the ground. And that was being greatly impacted. Uh, when it was funny, I did have a lot of popcorn, uh, a big bowl of popcorn. I was going to go offer some, offer some to Mr. Bacon, but... He wasn't too happy uh, uh, <laughs> when I, when that was happening. So, Let me turn to another issue, and that is the role of Congress when it comes to oversight. Because this week and next week, House Oversight, House Judiciary, with a lot of hearings, everything from immigration to Hunter Biden. When does it become overreach versus oversight? Well, we have 20 committees, so we and we have one oversight committee. So a lot of people are focused on the one committee. But there's 19 other committees that will be working. So I just, I know a lot of the media, I'm not knocking on you, but a lot of media is focusing on the one of the 20 committees. And surely, yeah, they're going to go be looking at a lot of those items. I would prefer them focusing on things that really matter to America. Like I think the border is a huge issue. And we've had 4 million uh, people across uh, illegally. That's twice the size of Nebraska's population, by the way. And it has a real impact on local schools and, and particularly in the border community. So I think, uh, you know, I would suggest that they prioritize those areas that have the most impact on Americans uh, as a whole. But I want to come back and say there are 19 other committees. The Judiciary Committee, too, will probably have some of this going on. Uh, but, you know, like I'm, we're on the Armed Services Committee. We're going to work on the defense bill. We're going to work on quality of life for our, our military men and women and make sure we're prepared for China. I'm on the Agriculture Committee with Salud. By the way, we're on the same and I. So we're going to work on the Ag Bill, the Farm Bill, right? So there's a lot of good things that will be happening outside of just the oversight. Congressman Carver Hall, years ago, members of Congress lived here in Washington and their families would socialize together. The children would play football or baseball or soccer together. A lot of that's changed in part because of 
jets and social media and the congressional calendar. The two of you, as part of the American Congressional Exchange Program, traveling to each other's districts. So if you could talk about what you learned about Omaha, Nebraska, and why you two paired up. Well, I think Bacon and I had a friendship before uh, we got acquainted with this program. So it was just a natural for us to do that exchange. But um, it was great going to each other's districts, getting to know the issues of the district that are important or priorities, uh, unique uh, differences and similarities. I remember going to the Offutt, uh, Vandenberg Space Force, the Offutt uh, um, Air Force Base, went to uh, Union Pacific uh, Station where they coordinate the trains throughout the country. We went to uh, one of the Nebraska universities there as well. Uh, had some great prime rib uh, because they're known for uh, their cattle in the area. And it was just a nice exchange. I uh, One of the highlights was having dinner with uh, Don and his family and his wife, Angie. And since then, just getting to know him and his family uh, has been a real treat and really helped expand our own relationship. Is he a good host? He's a darn good host. I didn't expect that the size of that prime rib I was going to be eating, but I love prime <laughs> rib, so I was in heaven. And then you travel to uh, Central Valley. Right. And we very Central, 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 Central Coast. And very similarly, we had just a great tour. We went to Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base. We were on the largest space booster that, that we have. It is like multiple, multiple stories high. Stood on top of that, you know, looked look down. So it's just a, a massive piece of space launcher, right? <clears throat> so we were there at Vandenberg. And, you know, I come from an agriculture state, though Omaha has more agribusiness. Uh, but, you know, we're corn and soybeans, beef, cattle, pork. You go to his district, Salud's district, heavily agriculture too, but totally different. Berries, nuts, uh, you know, that just... But heavily, heavily, wine. Yeah, wine, a lot of wine. <laughs> so, so while while there we, we ate healthy and had good red wine as well. Uh, but we got to tour, uh, you know, the, some of the coastline, some of the agriculture uh, areas, as well as a, a winery and the Air Force Base. And it was great. Did you one up him on a specialty over some ice cream? Well, he wanted to show me some uh, olive oil, uh, olive oil production. That's Good agriculture product out of uh, California, and I and I can eat habanero peppers like an apple. I'm a I'm a I like a lot you of like spice. spicy things. I like it when my scalp's sweating. And that's when I'm having really good food, right? So he gave me some jalapeno olive oil, and I could about drink it like a glass of water. But he he t had some and some got caught in his throat. I had almost to a Heimlich maneuver <clears> to save him. Truth be told, he was bragging about <laughs> his prowess uh, with chilies and and salsa. And uh, so we went to this olive mill, uh, olive uh, pressing um, facility, and they were showing us how they put this olive um, oil with jalapeno uh, on ice cream. Remember, it was mm. a little odd, but it was we were tasting on it. On ice cream? On ice cream, and it, but it's pretty good. Once you do it, it's, it's, it, it amazes you. But I grew, up eat, I grew up eating chili and jalapenos. It's like nobody's business. It's... It went down the wrong way, <laughs> so I started coughing, and he never lets me forget that. So, yeah. it's just so hit, hit him on the back. Yeah. I had to give him a drink of water. <laughs> so I was going to give you one fun fact about your congressional districts, and during the break, you were coming up with two or three. So, Congressman Bacon, let's turn to you first. Well, Warren Buffett is from our district, lives in Omaha. His dad was the congressman from Omaha back in World War II, and he started uh, the Congressional breakfast for the Nebraska delegation has been in effect ever since. And so we still do these Wednesday breakfasts that were started by Howard Buffett. And then maybe a second fun fact, we have 85% of the world's pivot irrigation sales out of Omaha. You go all over the world, you'll see uh, Omaha irrigation companies, Europe, Middle East, you name it. And so very proud of that. California 24, Central Coast. Besides the wine being extraordinary, uh, Oprah lives in my district. Uh, Prince Harry and Ms. Merkel live in my district. And the Egg McMuffin was started in my district. Who knew? Let's turn to some of the more serious issues. Uh, documents involving the former Vice President Mike Pence, uh, President Joe Biden, former President Trump. Where is all of this going to lead, Congressman Bacon? Now, we should treat everybody with the same standard. Uh, we tend to... Oh, look at that guy, how bad but how bad that guy is, and try to ignore what happened on our side. And the law is the law. 
I, I've dealt with classified top secret information since 1985. I can guarantee I have no classified in my home, nor next to my nine-year-old Chevy Impala. <laughs> you don't right? have a Corvette like no, the president? No, I do not. And so, but, you know, if where laws are violated, we, we hold people to the same uh, standards. It would be my, you know, my position on that. Um, and I don't really understand how three leaders like that could have classified in their private possession. I, they they, they t so tightly control the classified in the House side. When they give us classified slides, they're numbered. So he'd be like number 13, I'd be number 14. They just go on and they pick them up and they know and you're not allowed to take notes out. You're not allowed to bring in your cell phones and your GPS watch. So it's very tightly controlled. And so just, it's hard to understand how that happened. This is when you're in the skiff, as they call it. Skiff, but sometimes even in our uh, committee hearings, we get classified and everything. And you have to put away your phones, your GPS watch. You can't take notes in or out. Uh, everything's numbered uh, uh, when it comes to slides. And that's even that's in the committee hearings itself. When you, heard that, yeah. when you heard that the former vice president, Mike Pence, also had documents, did you breathe a sigh of relief? Was this now viewed as something that is bipartisan? It's not just President Joe Biden? Not necessarily a sigh of relief, just uh, what it made me realize is that we've had procedures, but they haven't been followed uh, or implemented effectively uh, <clears throat> in the executive uh, branch. Uh, I think uh, Don pointed out how we do it here in Congress, uh, and, and it's, I think, worked well overall. But clearly, uh, they haven't been consistent uh, in tracking and custodianship of their documents. It's pretty easy. You, you document, you number them, you, collect, you issue them, you collect them, and if one's missing, you take action uh, and follow up to see where that document might be. Clearly, they're not doing that over there. And uh, they need to come up with a procedure that's really going to be effective because I think uh, president, presidents of both parties have failed. And clearly it's become evident that they haven't been as effective as they need to be with these important documents. It seems that it's been treated too cavalier uh, with that. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've worked in offices where you have top secret on your desk because the office itself is in a scuff. But I guarantee you, before you put papers in your briefcase, you go through it very carefully to make sure you know what you're going in and out with. And, and in some cases here, this could have been done by staff members. That's why it's fair to have an investigator look at all of it, you know. Tuesday morning, Congressman Bacon, you are in your House party meeting. George Santos from New York stands up. What happened? Well, when he stood up and got behind the mic and he was waiting uh, for, we, we call it uh, for, the good or, for the good order. And so at the end of the meeting, anybody can get up and make one minute comments. And so we have an hour meeting, normally at the 40 minute point, uh, it's done and anybody can do a one minute on whatever they want. And he got up behind the microphone and go, oh, this, cause we haven't heard him speak yet. Uh, and so, he, but he just, he said, and I appreciate him doing this. He did the right thing. He said, he, he knew he was being a distraction, uh, that he was gonna recuse himself off all the committees. He said, not permanently. He says, oh, hopefully he can let the dust settle and get some things figured out. And then maybe he would like the opportunity to come back on the committees at some point. What do you think of George Santos? Well, what he did was wrong. You know, I mean, it wasn't just a lie here and there. I mean, it sounds like much of his life was fabricated. And, you know, the people should be most angered is his constituents because they, they voted for something they didn't. Um, they, well, they were, were voting for a lie on that. But, you know, ultimately, when it's all said and done, it's going to be between him and his constituents on this. The Ethics Committee is going to look at it, and we can make some more judgments by the time they get done. And from your side of the aisle, he sat down with One American News and basically said, from here on out, I'm going to make sure that I tell the truth 100%. Your thoughts? Did he tell the truth then? Um, you know, this wasn't just a, a few lies, one lie. I think every time he speaks, overwhelmingly, it's a lie. So um, it, it's, been, it, it's been shocking that somebody could get away with that. Uh, get elected as a member of Congress and continue to lie. Uh, it's just, and, and now we're hearing all kinds of things that I think the ethics uh, committee is going to be looking at that could be criminal and and and, and certainly against the uh, FEC rules. So we'll see what transpires. But certainly, um, he reminds me in in Latino culture, or uh, there's this bingo game called Loteria, and now they have a card for him called mentiroso, liar. So it's, I thought that was kind of funny. So when I ran as a challenger, and even since then, all my emails from the Air Force were foia by the Democrat Party 
uh, anything public, they, they totally scrutinized. They had investigators going through my background and they were going through all my eva- pers- officer evaluations in, in the military. So my, I was so investigated because I'm in a very purple district. I, for the life of me, don't understand how this was not found out by the DCCC, we call them, you know, the Democrat uh, campaign arm, because uh, they have, that's what they do. They investigate. And I mean, I, every email I've ever done in the Air Force got, fo- got foiled by the Democrat Party. And uh, thankfully, they couldn't find anything. <laughs> well, it's just amazing that they didn't find anything. Or uh, yeah. it's 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 baffling that yeah. this didn't come out during the campaign. It doesn't make sense compared it, it to doesn't everything make else sense. they've done. Clearly, Democrats wouldn't want to forego winning the seat uh, to have somebody like that win and then later on make it mm-hmm. an issue. That would be very... Now, that someone s- dropped the ball on the Democrat campaign arm side. That is the looming question. I mean, really, political malpractice. Mm-hmm. Hey, real quickly, before we take a break... Um, is this the lost art that you two can travel with each other, come to each other's district, even the, the jalapeno uh, olive oil? Well, I saved them. <laughs> well, I, I think Bacon touched on it. I think there's a group of us. We're not the only ones, but, you know, the more social opportunities we could create for people to get to know one another, uh, it's very different when you get to know one another than when you don't want to, don't know one another. You're more inclined to be respectful. You're more inclined to be more civil. And I think... Uh, Finding those opportunities is is a great way. Uh, Congressional delegations travel is one of them. And uh, you really get to know one another and build on that. Uh, I hope we're not the exception. I hope we're the foundation of other people doing the same. We've got Guantanamo, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Europe, Asia, to include Japan. Kuwait. Uh, Yeah, Japan, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan. We did a week in Taiwan that was... uh, very enjoyable. So we, and I, I know I'm missing. And some. learned a lot. Yeah. I wonder what the two of you would have been like in college. We would have been probably in trouble, <laughs> <laughs> but good friends. Yes. <laughs> two members of Congress, a Democrat and Republican from Nebraska and California, will come back with some student questions and talk about the war in Ukraine at the one year mark. Back in a moment. Thanks to the uh, Washington Center students, Republican Don Bacon. He represents Omaha, Nebraska. Democrat Salud Carbajal, who's from California's Central Coast. To both of you, thank you again for joining us. And I do want to talk about the war in Ukraine as we approach the one-year mark and debate in your party, Congressman Bacon, in terms of continued funding. Where is this going? What more should the U.S. do? And from your military expertise as a retired Air Force, how does this end? First of all, it's a minority of our party that is in opposition to our aid to Ukraine. I think the majority supports what we're doing. I tell people it's it's in our national security interest that Ukraine remain independent. If Russia prevails, uh, it will not end in Ukraine. It could very well be the Baltics next, which are NATO states. Uh, Putin's already called the Baltic states renegade states. So my point would be you have to treat a bully now. You can't ignore a bully because the bullies will not stop until they're stopped. And so, so I believe that we will have a majority support what Ukraine needs. I would say this about President Biden. He's, he's got there at some point where he needs to be, but he's always been a little slow on the weapons that are needed. Uh, he could have been much earlier with some of our better weapons, but he's there now. And I, so I commend the president where he's at at this point. What we need on our side to continue the support is ensure that we have a good itemized list, what has been given to Ukraine. And we've been committed to that. DOD said they will do that, uh, give us an unclassified list so that we can show that it's accountable, accounted for, itemized. And the second thing that we need is a list of what other countries have provided so Americans know that they're not doing this by themselves. And DOD promised they would do that as well. And this is how we can keep support high for supporting Ukraine. Very quickly, because you're familiar with NATO, Finland and Sweden, good for the organization? Absolutely. And it's very discouraging that Turkey is... Uh, Playing, the, playing hardball on this. Uh, Finland and Sweden are both, I mean, I've been there. I've w- worked for those countries. They will bring a lot of capability to NATO, and they actually provide more security leverage for the Baltic states because they're sort of out there by themselves. And having Finland and Sweden as part of the NATO team, will, it means a lot to the Baltic countries. And you've been to Ukraine on a couple of occasions. Yes. Give us a sense of what you saw firsthand, what your takeaway was. Well, we went to Kiev, and we were able to see some of the bombing that had occurred, but not a whole lot. They were able to rebuild really quickly, I think, 
to be able to uh, demonstrate a sense of normalcy to the rest of the Ukrainian population. But of all the conversations we had with officials in Ukraine, uh, I think the most important were learning was learning about the tracking systems that they have, uh, the transparent systems of all the equipment that is coming into Ukraine to give confidence to the American people and us in Congress that it's being used appropriately, that it's not being misused, that it's not going lost. Uh, so it it gives everybody confidence to continue to support them with the weapons and that they need to be able to be effective in thwarting uh, Putin uh, back back to where he started from. We can't thank both of you enough for being with us here in our studios. We have some great student questions, and we'll begin with that. Uh, I believe Grace is first up. Hi. Um, so my question for you is, how do you balance the need for bipartisanship with perhaps more partisan views of your constituents? And very quickly, your last name, where are you from? I'm Grace Harrison. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And where do you go to school? I'm a junior student at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Congressman Bacon. Uh, great question. Well, I'm a conservative by ideology. Uh, you know, that's my orientation, conservative. I've also studied the Constitution. I've studied the Federalist Papers. And this system is designed not like a parliament where the majority gets its way. It is designed to protect the minority. And the only way to get things done in a bicameral with three branches of government, you have to find consensus areas. And that's what James Madison said in the Federalist Papers. It, is, it was forces us to find areas of consensus con, or Consensus with the different factions, he called it. They didn't have parties uh, back then. He and hated I, the parties. Yeah, but he called them factions. And I've, I've embraced that. If you want to move our country forward on immigration, the border, health care, trade, energy, you got to work across the aisle, find work, and we agree, because that's how you get things done. And so that's really putting our country first. Well, in my district, I will tell you that no matter who you talk to, Democrats or Republicans, uh, overwhelmingly, they want us to work together to get things done, to find common ground. Uh, they hate when we get, get caught up uh, with ideological wars, where there's no common ground, uh, where we can move things forward. They want us to govern. So how do we reconcile, which is what the question was? I, I think we, we do what we can uh, on issues that we know the district wants us to uh, vote a certain way, but at the same time, I think they give us the green light to try to find common ground and work across the aisle so that we can govern and that we can uh, be productive as members of Congress. I think to come here and to not work to find that common ground and work on bipartisanship is not what Congress is all about. It's become a dirty word to compromise. To govern is to compromise. And yet there is this tit for tat, Speaker Pelosi, now Speaker McCarthy, kicking members off committees, is that good for the institution? Short answer is no. It was very, I, I call the whole process from two years ago till now, it is corrosive. It throws fuel or gas on the partisan fire that we have. I'll tell you, I, I didn't agree with the comments made by members on my side of the aisle that got removed from committee. But from 1789 until the 117th Congress, the majority party has never, never kicked off a member of the minority party off committee. And then it happened four times in the last Congress. And it, it made us mad, even if I disagreed with the comments that were made or actions done by uh, members that, that were kicked off those committees. And so there's, there is, some people want to say it's retribution. They say that on their own, they've earned it. I think it, in reality, is some retribution because we would never have done this again if it didn't happen two years ago. But my, my suggestion to the speaker and to the majority leader is, okay, once this is done, let's go to Hakeem Jeffries, shake hands, say, let's never do this again. Let's go back to what we've done since 1789 and let the parties police themselves, because this is really, it's, it creates more rancor and anger, and it's, and it's not healthy. Another student question. Uh, Mark is next. Introduce yourself. Where do you go to school and where are you from? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Anthony Judici. I go to school at the University of New Hampshire in Durham. Uh, I'm from Summersworth, New Hampshire. And my question to you is because my neighborhood, my area is becoming more at risk of flooding. Uh, what measures do you uh, support to actually make American communities more resilient to cl climate events like flooding, wildfires, etc.? And certainly California has seen its fair share of rain. Yes, uh, I'll take that. Um, this last Congress, we passed two very important pieces of legislation, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure uh, law 
in the Inflation Reduction Act. Both invest uh, significant amounts of money in our infrastructure, but not only in our infrastructure as we have done in a status quo way, but in a way that uh, incentivizes more resilient infrastructure. So I, I think a lot of funds have been appropriated to be able to do that. So I'm hoping that in the next four to five years, We'll be able to get that money out through various uh, programs to ensure that communities throughout the country, such as your communities, have the resources it needs to create better, more resilient infrastructure and to adapt to this climate crisis that we're seeing play out through changing weather throughout the country and the world. You guys are asking great questions. Thank you. Kylie is next. Come up to the microphone, introduce yourself, and tell us where you're from and where you go to school. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kylie Brown. I'm from Earlham, Iowa, and I'm a junior at Buena Vista University in Iowa. Um, my question to you guys is the Farm Bill is an essential piece of legislation passed every five years. It was last passed in 2018. Um, prior to COVID and the rising inflation rates, how do you see these affecting the new Farm Bill that would be passed? Congressman Bacon. <clears throat> I think there's like two contentious points on the Farm Bill that we'll have to work through. What is the, the top line? I believe the top line for the Farm Bill will be somewhere equivalent with whatever inflation. So it's not going to be a big increase. I don't think we'll see a big decrease either, somewhere within the inflation realm. And maybe the other contentious point will be work requirements on the SNAP program and what, what that may entail. Uh, we have to have a farm bill. We have to have, uh, I would call it, uh, competitive crop insurance prices. The farmers will tell you that's the number one thing they need is to have affordable cro crop insurance. Uh, in the Midwest, we need more trade focus because we are export states we could feed the, a lot of the world with our beef, pork, corn, soybeans from Nebraska. I know Iowa is just the same. So trade is vitally important. I'm a big believer in research because, you know, we have like the African swine fever that could devastate us. we got to find a solution uh, to that like we did with foot and mouth uh, disease. We have a vaccine for that now, right? And finally, I think biofuels and ethanol stuff is extraordinarily important for the Midwest. We want to have that in there. So I think we're going to get a bipartisan Farm bill. There's those two contentious areas, but I think we'll work through it. The Senate already has most of this already written, and it's very bipartisan. So I think the I I feel pretty I'd say very optimistic about what we'll do. And very quickly, this is an issue near and dear to you too. Yes, uh, agriculture is the number one industry in my district. Uh, not to mention that California is the number one agriculture producing state in the nation. Uh, a lot more specialty crops than other areas throughout the country. But I agree with uh, most of the items that uh, Don Bacon rattled off in terms of needing a farm uh, bill that addresses all those different titles and components, 12 titles to be exact, uh, that makes investments in research, that also touches on a number of other issues like crop insurance to help make sure that our farmers can be prosperous with all the challenges that they have with climate change, with uh, with all the economics that they, ha they face day in and day out. There's also some tangential issues that uh, affect uh, farmers that are outside the purview of the farm bill, such as labor, immigration issues, and water. And we need to make sure that we're doing everything possible to address the intersection of those issues as well, uh, when at all possible, through the farm bill. Let's get one more question. Emily is next up in our remaining few minutes. Welcome, Emily. Tell us about yourself. Hi, my name is Emily Drzewski. I'm a junior at Juniata College, and I'm from White House Station, New Jersey. My question for the both of you are, what are your hopes and goals for the future of our nation? What a great question. Congressman Bacon. Well, we are the most powerful country in the world. We are the beacon in the world for democracy, free markets, rule of law. Yeah, we're not perfect We got because we're human. My dream is to pass on to my kids. I got four of them, and they're all, three are married. I have seven grandkids with an eighth on the way here any day. And the generations when I'm gone, that they can live in the most economically competitive country in the world where anybody can climb that ladder of success through hard work and character. Uh, so we want to make sure we're the land of opportunity for four, five, six, as so long as we can go uh, as a country. So that's my dream, to preserve this great heritage that we received from our forefathers and, and be able to pass it on. Congratulations on the grandkids. Your quick thought. I have two grandkids, too. Um, you know, my hope is that first we shore up and make sure that our democracy is resilient and strong and can continue to weather uh, centuries and decades to come, uh, that we are economically sound and that we are providing opportunity 
and as much opportunity to all Americans so that they could live that American dream that our forefathers and mothers came to this country for. We're a country of immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself. I came here when I was five years old. I'm lucky to have gotten a great education, served my country in the Marine Corps, uh, and now as a member of Congress. I'm, I'm grateful. But I want to make sure that my grandkids have an opportunity to be able to purchase their own home someday, that they're able to get a good education, that they can serve their communities in different ways and be economically prosperous. I want that for all Americans, and I'm hopeful that we in Congress can lay that foundation to continue to have more people live that American dream uh, as possible. We have a minute left, but I do want to ask you both. You're both part of the Bipartisan Policy Center's ACE program, American Congressional Exchange. So as you go back to other members, Republicans and Democrats, what's the value of this traveling to each other's congressional districts, getting to know each other and having a friendship, even though you are from two different parties? Well, you build friendships across the aisle. Of course, we had a friendship and it got just stronger uh, from the trip. But it's happened with a whole host of other members. They visited each other's uh, congressional office. You learn the challenges that Salute has, for example, the priorities, some of the forces to drive his district. So this is, it's a great opportunity. I encourage all members to do it. You get the last word. Absolutely. I think it's fundamental if we're going to build the type of relationships and create the type of civil a governing environment that we want in Congress is to find opportunities to continue this type of program and expand those opportunities to members to interface and to build friendships and relationships. When I think of something that uh, I, I need to team up with somebody from the other side, the first person that comes to my mind is, let's check if Bacon can do this. And if not, we'll go down the road to other friends and colleagues that I have. But Bacon is my go-to uh, friend across the aisle, and uh, we'll continue to work with him. So things might get done in this Congress. Think about the last divided Congress, we had a balanced budget. I mean, back in the Clinton area with Newt Gingrich, we can do great things in a divided government. It forces us to work together. Gentlemen, both of you, thank you. And my thanks to uh, producer Nate Sweet, the entire staff here at Sirius XM, my colleagues at the Bipartisan Policy Center, the amazing students from the Washington Center. Thank you for your questions and for your insights. I'm Steve Scully in Washington, the studios of Sirius XM POTUS Channel 124. Thank you for listening.